Hey guys, this is Peter Oldring. You might know me from some of the voices I've done on Total Drama Island, like Cody, who is not that much different than my own voice, uh, like Ezekiel, who's like kind of like more like daddy, like sort of kind of like some of the guys that I grew up with is uh, sort of that sound as Ezekiel. And then, of course, Tyler as well, who's like kind of like a cool dude, man. That's Tyler. Woo man. Yeah. Uh, and you are watching Du Bois or listening to Du Bois podcast or watching the Du Bois YouTube channel. Cody, the Codester, the Codemeister. Dude, psyched to be here, man. I see the ladies have already arrived. All right. Oh, dear Cody, if one of us drowns, I want it to be me. Me too. They thought they could leave me and depart, but this stowaway's got winning in his heart. Ladies and gentlemen, Tyler. Wicked Wipeout, man! Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an episode of Voice Podcast. My guest today is a voice actor, actor, comedian, writer, producer, director, and many more. You may have heard his voices, Connor in Brace Face, Gus in Miss Spider's Sunny Patch Friends, Rabbit and My Friend Rabbit, Cody, Ezekiel, and Tyler in the Total Drama series, and you may have seen him as Corpo McIntosh in Psych, and Lonnie in Kicking It, and many more. So welcome, Mr. Peter Oldring. Welcome, Peter. Wow, what an intro. Joe, my friend, pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to be on your podcast, and, uh, you know, to be uh, talking a little bit about some projects that some of which go way back. You might have a better memory on them than I do, but that's okay. We're going to get through it. We're going to we're going to stumble through it. But it is really it's sincerely a pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Thank you for joining. You know, thank you for yeah. also being one of my childhood heroes. So thank you. Oh, my goodness. Well, I love it. I love it. You know, I, I, I did. Uh, over the years, I've gotten to do a lot of different animated projects and, and live action as well. And it's always uh, such a it's such an amazing thing when a, a project or a character or a role speaks to somebody, speaks to people. It's really it's really just such a treat because, of course, for us on the performing side of things, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of it's done a little bit in a vacuum. You kind of do it and then you never know. Is someone who's is someone going to watch this? Is no one going to watch this? Will somebody like this? Will they not like it? And so it's always it is always uh, just such a such a treat and such a, an honor to to speak to people that really responded to the projects because pretty much everything you know that I've ever done or that most people have ever done you're really invested in you're kind of putting your best foot forward and you're trying to um you know uh bring the best of yourself to whatever the project is some of them work better than others but it's always something that you care about so uh, I'm really glad that you have enjoyed uh, not only total drama but some other stuff too thank you yeah, okay. that felt, felt like I just gave a speech. Did I just give like a speech? Was that, was that, <laughs> it was like I was really, we weren't really having a conversation. All of a sudden I launched into something that sounded sort of poorly written. But I was like, you know, ladies and gentlemen, no, we'll have a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, what have you been up to? Like, how are you doing, Peter? I'm doing great. You know, I mean, um, so I'm trying to think total drama. Man, it goes back. I mean, yeah. uh, to think about when that show started. At that time, I was living in Toronto. I was uh, single. I was uh, likely performing with the Second City at that time on improvisation. Actually, you're just outside of Chicago, so you know the Second City well, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, and since that time, mm -hmm. I have moved to Los Angeles probably, oh man, Joe, it was probably 14 years ago, 13, 14, wow. 15. It's all a blur. Doesn't really feel like that long, but it's been a while. Uh, moved down here. I uh, got married. I'm a dad. Um, <laughs> and on very rare occasions, I will go and perform at the Second City. <laughs> wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I've... yeah. It's it's a uh, a lot of a lot of life since that particular show, mm -hmm. and uh, but I still have vivid memories of it. It's one of those shows, Total Drama, and a handful of others that really just strike a chord, and and it has just such a a loyal following of people who really just absolutely have loved it and i remember at the time it was really 
a very cool concept for a show that it was kind of as reality television, like Survivor, uh, as as those shows were really kind of finding a, a good foothold and an audience to have an animated show that kind of took a poke at that genre was really, really cool. At the time, it was kind of like it was early on in some of that reality stuff. So it was it was really a really cool thing to get to do. And also for myself, I love having the chance to do multiple voices on a program because it's, uh, you know, my background was always improvisation and comedy and jumping in and out of characters and all sorts of stuff. And so to be able to do multiple voices on it was one of those ones that I just, uh, you just love projects like that. It's just a really cool challenge. It's cool. Like how you could like, like imagine like a scene, like you were like in a scene together, like Cody, like, Oh my God, how do you do it? Like, wow. You know, it, it really is. It's, it's the help of the recording engineers who are always there ready to play a uh, reference in your head. It's, it takes a really great director to be sort of like, um, you're kind of slipping out of that voice and you don't even know it because it's kind of like, as you're trying to do it, you know, it takes it takes a, a team of people to sort of go like, I don't think that's him anymore. Let's go back and take a listen. Let's try it again. <laughs> so it, it's kind of um, it it is it, it takes a few people to do that. But then also, as I say, like I my whole entryway into doing any performing was mm -hmm. improvisation when I was, you know, going to school, going to high school and um I was improvising, had a really cool drama teacher who loved improv comedy and and there was a very, in the city that I grew up in, there was a really um, amazing theater called the Loose Moose Theater in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. <laughs> and it is, um, there's a couple of artistic directors there, but one of whom is a guy named Keith Johnstone. And he oh. wrote a book called Impro. And it basically, uh, you know, people would say he is the person that invented theater sports. So like that competitive oh. style of improv comedy. So why he was in calgary alberta who knows but it was it was kind of you know it was for me it was just such a fortunate thing to have a place like that um to go and improvise and so in doing that it was always about jumping in and out of a bunch of different characters you know what i mean like on the spot you know and 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 so somehow maybe that muscle it was just always kind of there to be able to do voices characters um, cause it's, it's not always that way. You know, I've got a lot of great friends who are amazing, um, actors, voice actors, comedians, but there's sort of that mental block about like, I, right. I, I can do that, but I can't really do multiple voices. You know, some people can, some people can't, it's just kind of a funny thing, but, but it was always just something that I love to do. And it was always something that in improv that I really loved is that, you know, you kind of visit a character for about two or three minutes until the scene gets boring and then it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah. See, believe it or not, I'm like, you know, after, you know, during the quarantine, I believe it or not, I started these podcasts to help like yeah. spread positivity, help cheer people up. Yes. Well, good for you, man. I mean, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff. Um, I mean, as you can see behind me, I am in sort of a, a studio uh, that's at my house. And mm -hmm. it, during the quarantining and, and the pandemic for about two and a half years I've spent an awful lot of time in here for things that you know I used to go and you'd go into a studio or you'd be uh, recording your project wherever whatever but in this last little bit I've spent a lot of time in a studio in just beside my living room uh asking my uh, five-year-old daughter to kind of keep it down because daddy's talking into his microphone and uh you know the pandemic has sort of brought about a few things uh, like that where it's like finding creative outlets yeah, finding different stuff different that you're stuff doing from your place what? it's you know it's amazing it's awesome mm -hmm. and that we can connect like this we're in you're outside of chicago i'm currently in los angeles and uh but we've just got this beautiful it's like we're in the same room we really are and it actually it looks like we could be in the same room like mm -hmm. you're in an office space i'm kind of in an office looking space so you know yeah yeah <laughs> Okay, so what made you want to become a voice actor? And what made you also want to become an actor? Like, what was your biggest inspiration? Like, who would you say? Would... Yeah, okay. So growing up, um, honestly, I, I would have to say having a handful of great teachers uh, when I was really young. I just remember still going way back, uh, uh, a teacher named uh, Lynn Bassetti, Miss Bassetti. And I, I'm sure that she's probably, I, I think, 
she married and has a different name. And I mean, this was such a long time ago, but she was probably the very first person that I just really connected with when I was in junior high school. And she just, it was this really fun, amazing class to go to and to play around and to be characters and to be creative. And it was really about kind of uh, cr creating your own stuff. So we weren't uh, in, in her class, we weren't sort of working on uh, scripts and that kind of thing. It was just kind of like, okay, make a car character monologue, you know, figure yeah. out a scene. We're going to, we're going to um, use some improv games. Um, and so I had a few great teachers. She was one of them in high school, another guy named um, uh, Jim Whitehead, who is Mr. Whitehead is the person that introduced me to an improv theater in Calgary. Uh, wow. which really started it all for me, you know, and he, he, again, another amazing teacher who had this uh, community feeling that he made in around his theater and with, and with all of the classes that were, um, you know, that, that he was teaching at the time. And he really kind of fostered a sense of uh, going out and doing your own thing, being creative, making your own mm -hmm. material, coming up with your own uh, uh, stuff. And, and we would do this, monthly lunchtime show which was basically just a pre like a a performance of self-generated material and and uh and so it was this these couple of teachers that really kind of fostered this sense of the creativity within yourself and improvisation was really such a logical next step for me and so to be introduced to the loose moose theater uh, mm -hmm. uh in calgary um i started performing there uh, you know, starting out at the, as, as, yeah. as like a, a, a newbie there in this uh, beginning part of the show, which probably looking back was probably not very good, but it was a place where, uh, you know, comedians, um, improvisers, actors, you could kind of cut your teeth on the stage in front of a live audience and you'll find out pretty quick how that's going. <laughs> and, uh, and in, in doing that, uh, comedy and and sketch comedy and improvisation has really just always been something that was just such a passion for me. And when you think about things like voice acting and mm -hmm. animation, um, it's such a perfect fit because you're really asked in improvisation to jump into so many different characters mm -hmm. on the spot, you know, in in the moment. And and one of the great tools of doing that is to be able to kind of make some pretty bold choices immediately on characterization that you're just going to jump into and you're going to kind of live in for a couple of minutes. And in animation, when you go in for an animation audition, you know, you're given a little bit of information on the character, but it's in a lot of ways, you're kind of looking at the artwork, you're taking in a little bit of the suggestions written down by um, the uh, writers of the show, producers of the show. And then you're just trying to make kind of an impulse decision on what sound might this be? And, and in a lot of animation auditions too, it becomes this dance of somebody saying like, you know, um, Hey, that's great, but can you make it more nasal? Yeah. Do you like it like that? Yeah. Okay. That's pretty good. Like a little more nasal, but maybe he's a bit more British and is he doing that? Oh, and he's a bit younger. Okay. So he's, he's a bit younger, but he's, he's also a bit nasal. So he's a bit younger and nasal. And it's uh -huh. like, you uh -huh. kind of in the moment have to be able to adjust what you're doing mm -hmm. because in some ways the producers, the directors, they have a sense, but they also are open to the inspiration about what this character might be, what this sound might mm -hmm. be, what this person, who this person might be. So the improvisation um, was just a, a real natural sort of bridge into doing animation. And so I, I know that this is, I mean, look, this is the longest answer to one of the shortest questions that you've asked, uh, but I'm, I'm gonna keep on talking, uh, which is to say, when I I then ended up going to a theater school in Montreal okay. called the National Theater School of Canada, and it's mm -hmm. like a um, an amazing place. It's a it's a conservatory. It sounds very serious. A conservatory theaters program, uh, which basically means you are practically uh, doing performing. Mm -hmm every day so it's not sort of like sitting down and reading textbooks on how to act it's really just kind of like showing up and saying like okay well we're gonna learn how to work with the rapier and dagger today and we're gonna do we're gonna do period dance today and okay we're doing we're singing today or we're you know working on this uh production of uh whatever show so 
<laughs> you are actually tangibly doing your your mm -hmm. acting you're working on the craft of acting and yeah. so one of the things that they did is they brought in somebody who was a a voice director mm -hmm. for um <clears throat> i believe at the time it was a voice director for radio drama comedy and drama oh. and <clears throat> they worked with us for a couple of weeks and we got to there was a little studio in the school and we got to kind of learn a little bit about mic technique so that you're kind of not like too much on it or, you know, <laughs> working on some of that kind of stuff. And like just hearing your voice coming through a microphone and hearing what that sounds like. And I really loved it. I really enjoyed it. And when I graduated that school, I was fortunate enough to get a, a rep represented in Toronto at the time. Mm -hmm. And still this, the, the company, the, uh, management company that represents me there. I've been with them for, oh my gosh, forever, forever, forever. Wow. Um, and there is a woman uh, at the time who was there who was in charge of the voice department. And she said, you know what? Come on in here, kid. Let's take a listen and see if you can do voiceover stuff. And and so I went in and I, I mm -hmm. she had me read a couple things and she said, I think you can really do this. And I was like, Elaine, I think I can really do this too. And so working with a little bit of her direction and using some of my background in improvisation and jumping into characters and a little bit of the mic technique and stuff that I had learned from uh, going to theater school, the National Theater School, she started to send me out on auditions. And before too long, it was just all of a sudden one of those things that animation was really something that I had a lot of opportunities in and I was getting work in and something that I just love because it's, you know, it, I, my roots, as I say, were always in comedy, improvising, sketch comedy. And to be able to have this outlet where you show up at a studio for an hour, you're going to jump into some crazy character and then you're going to leave it behind you and you'll visit it again next week. You know, it, it was really just an amazing, amazing, amazing a sort of part of the world that I've gotten to participate in. Wow. Well, yeah. I have, you, I have you know, I think you're a very talented actor and voice actor. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you very kindly. Thank you. You're welcome. You're very welcome. Now, did you like have anybody like you watch? Like, did you watch <clears> any, like, who did you watch like growing up? So, growing up, um, my inspirations, probably my, my two main inspirations were SCTV, which okay. I don't know if you've actually, of course, the second city in Chicago, right? The mm -hmm. SCTV is second city television. And uh, Second City was also in Canada, in Toronto. And so <clears throat> SCTV was this sketch comedy show that was uh, John Candy, uh, Joe Flaherty, Andrea Martin, Catherine O'Hara, uh, Dave oh, Thomas, yeah. Martin Short, um, Rick Moranis. I hope I'm not leaving anybody out. There's, there's, there's a, um, th but those, those comedy performers for me growing up were, Oh my gosh, I just thought SCTV was the funniest thing. I, I just loved it. And I've watched every episode. I've seen every sketch. I've in the <clears throat> in the years since then, I've had the chance to work with some of the people that were really my idols. Um, and you know, it's 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 unfathomable to kind of conceive of really in some ways because really that that show was such a was such a huge part of why I started getting into anything. I just, anything to do with entertainment. I just thought it was the funniest thing. And I loved these insane characters and these performers and the, the ridiculous nature of some of these sketches. I just loved it. And that really was one of the biggest reasons I got into any kind of performing. That mm -hmm. and there's another performer who goes way back uh, named Peter Sellers. And Peter okay. Sellers. Okay, so he did uh, all of the original Pink Panther movies where he was Inspector Clouseau and he's this ridiculous mm -hmm. character who's, you know, sort of solving these solving these uh, jewel heists uh, in the uh, 60s and 70s. Um, I yes. just loved uh, watching those movies as a kid, mm -hmm. you know, looking, look, getting to getting to watch um those Pink Panther movies, you know, so Peter Sellers and SCTV were probably mm, the two biggest inspirations for mm. getting into doing any kind of performing. And it really was just, it was just an obsessive enjoyment of their ridiculous form of comedy. 
that spoke to me and and then having some teachers that kind of fostered and invited you to bring your own creativity to whatever you're doing you know those those things all together were the whole reason i got involved in any kind of performing because if it wasn't for that i have no idea what i'd be doing i really have no clue i mean i've okay look i've had three jobs in my life okay one job was as a cashier at a store called Wolco when I was in the 11th grade. And Wolco is basically like a Kmart. It no longer exists. It's basically like Kmart. And I worked that job until the building was hit by lightning and the roof collapsed. Oh my God. And, then, yeah, and unfortunately, oh my. it was at night. Nobody was injured, just, you know, bins of wet socks and, you know, oh uh, t shirts and stuff. So I had that job for about like nine months until it was hit by lightning and then they started to, to sort of drag uh, bins of clothing that had been soaked with pieces of roof in it and they had what they called the destruction day sale in the parking lot and uh, and then they mm -hmm. took like a year and a half to rebuild Wilco so I, that job was mm -hmm. done for me and the only other jobs I did that I was a whitewater rafting guide <laughs> and then an actor a comedian nice. an improviser uh, and the whitewater rafting job, I had, an, uh, you know, a bit of an in there because my dad had a whitewater rafting company. So as a kid, I, I would go on the weekends and, and uh, sit in the middle of the raft while, you know, he was guiding. And then when I became 18, I was mm -hmm. able to guide the raft. So mm -hmm. I don't know if I hadn't fallen into comedy, I would either be now a senior manager at Wilco, if that still exists. <laughs> or uh, an old bearded guy on a river talking about, you know, all of the close calls I had on uh, big rapids. <laughs> so, but no, now I live in Los Angeles and I do silly voices and, and uh, get to act in crazy projects. And, you know, it's, who knows, life is pretty funny. Things, things just happen and you fall into these, uh, fall into these jobs and always out of a, a place of, a passion for them it it, mm -hmm. it it definitely takes that it takes like a focused passion to like have this make sense but it's when it's something that you just love and that you're kind of mildly obsessed about you find a way you know you always find a way so <laughs> yeah. wow. and i think you said pink panther is that like dun -dun 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 exactly exactly and actually it's funny because of course that uh movie they always would or those movies they would always start with the animated there was like a little animated um sort of sketch that they would do in the intro of those movies mm -hmm. with a pink panther and I, I actually i don't even really know why like what the connection was because so they would do that you know this the animated pink panther um would be in the first sort of two minutes of this movie and then it would be a live action movie and i believe in one of maybe it was the original movie, the diamond that had been heisted was called the Pink Panther Diamond or something like that. So it was kind of this strange, this strange thing that they had decided to then have an animated Pink Panther at the beginning while they played that music. But it, it obviously became like its own. I mean, there was a Pink Panther animated series and all this kind of stuff. But yeah. I, I think it stemmed from the original diamond that was heisted was called the Pink Panther Diamond. But I mean, I don't know, Joe. Someone's going to say that he has no idea what he's talking about. That's not the reasoning behind this. But that is my recollection of a movie that I had nothing to do with. That's my recollection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I, I know a lot of the, like older, like like 80s stuff, 70s, 60s, because my mom yeah. raised me on like, all that stuff. So Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I it's, uh, it, it's kind of, uh, it is funny to think, but th those, those movies i just remember vividly that my parents would be kind of maybe it was because it was kind of a movie that was it was relatively suitable for my sister and i but that they also enjoyed so it was kind of that it's that that perfect union of like as a family what are we going to watch that everybody might enjoy and and that was always one that kind of for a good chunk of time um was uh we all kind of got a kick out of it for different reasons you know what i mean and as i say there was a bunch of them there was yeah. a bunch that he did like the return of the pink panther and i can't even remember there's you know yeah. a, a bunch and peter sellers also did i've seen pretty much everything that he's ever done <laughs> but he yeah. also did so many other movies that were really amazing and funny and and mm -hmm. he's just such a uh, was such a truly such an inspiration just his ridiculous characters 
Mm -hmm. I just thought were so funny. So funny. Wow. Well, thank you, Peter Sellers. Right? Yeah. Thank you, Peter Sellers. My goodness. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> and he's got a name, though. Peter Oldring, Peter Sellers. I know there's, there's, you know, I want to say there's a lot of similarities, but there's, there's at least that one. <laughs> okay. Now what is your favorite voice acting role you've done and your favorite acting role you've done? Mm. Man. Oh man. I you know, that's the, a... Oh, sorry. No, 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 please, please. I was going to say, can, we... you, can you do the voice of your favorite voice? Too? Okay. Yep. Um, you right. know, I, honestly, uh, so I did this show um, called Glenn Martin DDS, and it's for Nickelodeon. It was a stop motion animation show, um, which was it's such a unusual, you know, there's not a lot of stop motion animation that happens because it is so time consuming uh, because they they've got to make all of these puppets. Um, there was a, a company in out of Toronto called Cup of Coffee. Uh, mm. I'm pretty sure who was the animation company that did this stop motion. And oh. they over at their studio in um, somewhere in the East end of Toronto, as I remember, they had set up literally 60 miniature sets. So wow. you would walk into this big studio uh -huh. and there would be 60 small like TV sets. Wow. And they so had all of the, you know, all of the furniture or the, um, you know, whatever, whatever setting that the scene is taking place. And they had basically made that whole little set and the puppets will actually, I've got a puppet here. Oh, hold on. Okay. May I, may I, you can Go sing ahead. the Pink Panther song while I step away. Hold on. Okay. I'm still here. I haven't let go. I'm coming. I'm back. I'm almost back. Okay. Hold on. What? Hold That's on. so cool. I gotta get my I gotta get my phone my earphones on again. Hold on. Hold on. Welcome, welcome back, brother. Okay. 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 Welcome back, Peter. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was gonna say at the beginning, I, I thought I wonder if I should walk in on an introduction. So this was nice. I still got to do my walk in. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so this is Connor McKenzie. And Connor McKenzie is this uh, guy who he's he's really kind of the sound comes very forward from him. And he's kind of almost got like a sloppy mouth. And so he his dad was uh, Glenn Martin DDS. And this was actually one of the puppets that they used. <laughs> when he laughed, it would be kind of this high awkward sound. But it, he he was he was this was one of the puppets that they used when they made the TV show for him on Nickelodeon. And they gave it to me. Mm. Um, and just afterwards, this is kind of like here's one for you to have of of your character Connor. <laughs> so. And you can see that he's got, there's just like his t-shirt is a cinder block, which is kind of like, because I think he's like a bit of a blockhead, um, but he was a younger brother and it kind of annoying. And um, Connor was always just kind of like one step behind everybody else a little bit, but he was, uh, it, I, I loved working on that show, not only because the, um, to have stop motion animation is so cool. It's like, it takes them a year to basically make an episode because they are literally moving every little piece, every little piece. They just like have a camera. They'd like move it like that. Then they take another picture. Then they'd move it like that. Then they take another picture. Then they move it like oh, that. So it's man. like, yeah, you've got yeah. to, oh, for man. them to get a minute's worth of animation takes forever. Oh, man. That's and crazy. so, um, this, but this is actually one of the, uh, doll puppets that they had mm. and then the one part that they would actually animate was the lips because you can't really stop motion flap the lips that would i mean could you imagine that would oh, just be torture be, yeah, <laughs> that, would yeah. Be, that would be somebody that would be a way to torture somebody we're going to stop motion this you need to make make every lip movement um and you can Whoa. see that connor's got like a mouthful of braces mm. and, the, and put on definitely by his dad but that was one of those jobs where 
when I went in, mm -hmm. they we began to just kind of work about where what the sound was, what oh. the sound was. You know, there was kind of 10 or 15 people in the room. It's actually OK. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty funny audition because usually when oh. you go and uh, audition for a, an animated project, you are in a voiceover studio. So you're talking into a microphone. You've got perfect mm -hmm. sound. It's it would be record a quality sound. But in this instance, I had done a couple of auditions for them and then mm. they brought me in to read for the producers mm. and of which there was quite a few and it was in a oh. boardroom. So wow. I was in a boardroom with a little lavalier microphone on me. So those are like those little ones that pin on here. Didn't have earphones. So it's not, it would not be record quality, but I basically come into this room mm -hmm. and sitting at a table and we just start talking Saying like, you know, well, what is this guy? And they're like, well, what do you, what do you think? And I was like, well, I mean, you know, he's, he's, I see his, his lips are really out because he's got a bunch of braces in his mouth. So it kind of looks like if that's the case, you're going to have, you know, this talk, he's having trouble talking over this braces. It looks like that. It's in his way. And then they're like, yeah. And they're like, maybe, maybe a little less lippy. Cause it's, it's too hard to understand, you know? So you gotta, you gotta put it back so people can understand. They're like, maybe, Maybe bring it up in pitch a little bit. And maybe his maybe his voice is breaking just a bit because he's kind of at that awkward age in his own development. So when he laughs, it's kind of high, but then his voice also goes down a bit, you know? And so we kind of like came to that sound together. And that was just one of my favorite projects because I also got to, we recorded it here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And... I got to travel up to back to Toronto where I had lived for many years and got to go and see how they were making this stop motion. And it was just such a cool thing to walk into this studio wow. where you've got all these little miniature sets and all the different people who are manipulating the puppets as they would call them and mm -hmm. putting together this show. It was really, really cool. And, you know, the other thing that was such a fun thing for me on that program was um, they, they had set up my contract in this way that was called like a plus four, which means I do my character of Connor and I can do up to four other characters in each episode. Oh man. And so it was one of these things where they had somehow early on, it was like at a table read or something. Where they said, oh, we're short on having these other characters, people to read these other characters. So they gave me like, you know, the other four characters to read. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I, as we're reading through, I'm, you know, putting on these other voices. You know what I mean? Like as, as we're doing it and making these other voices and talking as Connor, I might be talking it as his grandmother too. And, you know, and like, so to be able to do that, sure. it was so fun. And also I think the producers were kind of like, wait a second, you can actually really do other voices. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I always, I always kind of have. And so they set it up that basically every episode I would get to do my main guy, Connor, but then maybe I'd also get to do somebody else in the show. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it was for me, I love that show because I, I love the character of Connor mm -hmm. who was always kind of like good natured, but, was always like the pestering, annoying little brother going through the most awkward period of time in everyone's life, being a teenager and, um, and, and then being able to do all of these other voices and, and the other performers that I got to work with on that show were, I mean, some people that were just like legends to me, Betty White uh, played my grandmother on that show. Well, that's cool. and Mel Brooks was played by oh uh, I'm trying to remember. Who, oh, actually, you know, he played <laughs> he played Santa Claus in an episode and <laughs> Don Johnson was my dad on that. Wow. Uh, but, you know, Catherine O'Hara and um, Kevin Nealon were played my mom and dad on that. And so I got to see and work with them a great deal in that period of time. And Catherine O'Hara, mm -hmm. who was uh, one of the original cast of SCTV, who I was just such an idol of to be able to work with her over you know two three years together on this show um showing up uh the uh 
the writers, the producers of that show would allow us to kind of like be a little bit improvisational with it. So we were kind of afforded not only to read what was on the script, but then like as we're feeling it to just be able to just kind of riff with it a bit. <laughs> and having that form of play with each other was just such a such a just such a great experience and and such a dream come true. Kevin Nealon, who is truly one of the funniest people that you can meet. He just, he's just has such a, first of all, he has such a, a kind demeanor about him. Like there's just a kindness that, um, that is him. He's so easygoing and he's just effortlessly funny. Always, always. He just sort yeah. of has such a playful, effortless comedic quality about him. So that was a show that I, I really loved doing because I love the character. I love the idea that every week I'd get to like jump into like two or three other, four other, you know, small characters in an episode. But it was just like a chance to do like something ludicrous and a different sound that you're only going to live in for like two or three lines and then it's gone, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, I always loved that. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite acting role? Like a, not right. Person? Acting wise. That's a good question. Um because mm. you've done like you've done Lonnie you've done mm -hmm. for Macintosh you've done you were in you know I gotta say I you know I you're right now that you mentioned that that um uh Corporal Macintosh or was it Corporal or Cor he, it, RCMP officer I believe yeah. I believe we called him Corporal Macintosh I, I'm, I'm trying to remember now I'm kind of stumbled up on it but yes um that was in um oh, what was the show called again psych Yes, I come on. Oh my god, dude, this is horrible. Apologies Sorry. to everybody involved in that amazing show. Uh, but yes, yeah, of course. Um, Macintosh uh, was this sort of bumbling RCMP officer who, uh, you know, the, the guys from Psych had come up to Canada in search of a uh, criminal, and so they sort of were partnered up with this bumbling Macintosh. Uh, uh, and that was so, so fun for me because in some way uh -huh. I was getting to do like nowhere near, but it was like the fun idea of, uh, like Peter Sellers, the pink Panther, like kind of a bumbling detective. I got mm -hmm. to do my version of like a bumbling detective a little bit, you know, this kind of by the book, dopey RCMP officer who's playing it totally by the book with these two you know cool agents from the u.s who are kind of uh you know uh telling him what to do and all this stuff and for me that was like a really fun silly role and i just i love doing that and and the creator a guy named steve uh steve marks um i'm i think i think it is i, I have to i, I feel bad because this is, this is now a little a little while back but he was such a uh, such a funny dude. Oh my gosh! I mean, the, the show itself had elements of comedy and elements of like mystery and intrigue. Um, I think that he had said that his dad was a police officer, or a detective, or something like that. So he sort of was, you know, was kind of writing into some detective kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I had such a fun time on that show because they kind of. I always love when it when when something in, involves a bit of comedy as well. I, I have been fortunate enough to do just like true drama, like you know, real dramatic roles, and and I I love having the opportunity to do that. And but I think my favorite is you know if there's if there is like a bit of a comedic edge to it, it's always something that I'm I've just always been drawn to. It's kind of what I like watching. Mm -hmm. It's it's just something that I'm really kind of drawn towards. You know. Yeah, I like that. And it now for the voices, if you don't mind, for the viewers at home, you know, sorry, me, Cody, Ezekiel, and Tyler, can you? Oh my gosh. So, you sorry. know, so uh, Cody isn't, isn't that far from me. Like he, he would be probably the closest to me because uh, like, um, because he would, he would be just sort of a younger, more excited version about me. And there is all, almost a little bit of aspect of um, Connor McKenzie in there too. It's just that uh, Connor goes up here, but it's still kind of mm -hmm. like, in that same vein. And the thing that I love about Cody and that, that sort of mm -hmm. that I, I love the most about him is that he is this kind of, he's the underdog and he's also yeah. kind of the eternal optimist. And he's like putting himself out there and he's not the coolest kid in that uh, uh, group of, of, you know, kids on total drama, but he's just like, he's putting himself out there and he believes in himself and he is just doing it. And I, I always love cool. characters like that. In some level, it's probably, 
they're really versions of myself because you know i was never really like the cool kid i was always like in comedy in theater and i was always like an optimist uh, optimistic kind of individual who I, I i sort of found my way into social circles and found my you know how i would navigate like the insanity mm -hmm. that is uh school and the rest of it i i found my way through comedy and through kind of being uh, an optimist a little bit of the underdog in some in some capacities i think you know and um and so maybe i i kind of am close to him now ezekiel uh as i remember was really more of like i i i take a page out of the book of like bob and doug mckenzie who were sctv kind of like the total hoser, eh? Like, as I remember, wasn't he kind of more like a hoser kind of type guy? Yeah. And yeah. didn't say, didn't say too much, but he was, he was kind of more in that range, you know, like, uh, and I think when I, when I was coming up with the voice for him, that toque, that knit cap that is pulled oh. down reminded yeah. me so much of like Bob and Doug McKenzie, which were Dave Thomas and Rick Moranis. They did these, kind of iconic characters that were really like the epitome of the Canadian hoser. And, um, and so it was inspired by those two guys. And I'll oh. tell you, I, I was really fortunate enough to, with uh, still over time and for different reasons, I, I got to meet and work with Dave Thomas, who again, one of those yes. SCTV like legends and, and is, is, you know, really one of my, one of my close pals, like, wow. I feel like, you know, family with him a bit. And he directed me and, um, some folks in a movie called, uh, it was called white coats. Uh, and I, but then it was also, I think it was white coats in Canada and intern Academy in the U S or it was something, something funny. There was like a couple of names going on with it, but it was like, uh, myself, one of my best friends, Pat Kelly, who I've done like a lot of comedy stuff with really is my comedy partner, you know, um, uh, Dan Aykroyd was in that Dave Foley was awesome. in that, uh, uh, there was, yeah, it was, it was like a, a hospital comedy movie that was really silly, really ridiculous, but it was just one of the funnest things to work on as well, but got to work with Dave and have become, we've worked on lots of stuff since that together, but, um, have become friends and, and that, that role and that, character ezekiel was before i met dave and that was really inspired by something that dave had done dave and rick moranis wow. so that was pretty cool and now honestly you're gonna have to help me out because <laughs> so i've done connor i've done ezekiel and uh who's the third who's my third guy in this tyler tyler oh. and as i now look this one this is probably someone's gonna i'm gonna do it and then watch well, i don't even know what the heck i'm gonna do because I, it was such a long time ago but he was like Tyler was more like this, the jock, right? Yeah. And so like with him being the jock, I'm sure I was probably pitching it down, putting, putting chest out, being like a cool guy and like probably not too, not too, uh, maybe not too much going on upstairs because didn't really have to, he, he, he could kind of make his way through with this brawn. Didn't necessarily need everything up there. So I, I don't remember if that is really his tone, but you can tell me, is that him? I heard some of Tyler, sorry, Peter. Yeah, no, please. Sorry. I if you want, I could play like a little clip. Do, that do, please. Okay. Oh my gosh, that would be so helpful. <laughs> okay. I got you. Because I this is this is the funniest thing. Like, you know, it's one of the uh you know, now that you're gonna set up this clip, but before mm -hmm. before we uh continue, you know, this is the first interview that I have done with anybody in regards to anything to do with total drama and really a lot of animation stuff. And part of it is oh my gosh i love performing and and doing these roles but i know for instance with the total drama community um mm -hmm. and some of the other shows that i've worked on there is such a there is such a reverence and such a a fan a base for these shows and i always feel intimidated because i sort of go i'm so grateful to be a part of it and i really love doing it but i know i don't know these shows as much as the fans know these shows and so mm -hmm. i'm always kind of like a bit nervous going like I know I, I, I did this and I, and I absolutely love doing it. I have some memories of doing it, but I know I don't know this show as well as 
people that have really sort of fallen in love with you. So I always feel a bit intimidated because it's so it's like right. you playing a reference is exactly what I need. And Actually. then the other thing is, this is how when we go in to do a record session, this is how it works. I would show up and uh -huh. someone would say, OK, you're going to do Tyler. And I'll go, OK, well, how's Tyler sound again? And they go, hold on, I'm pulling up a reference. I'd listen to the reference, drop into the voice, and then we just do it. So this will be exactly like we're doing a record yeah, session. You'll play the yep. reference, uh -huh. and then we'll see if I can match it. Okay. You want me to show you, or do you want me to play it? Play it. I could show you. Uh, let's do both. Let's see. Oh. What do you got? Yeah. Oh, if you can see it, the glare. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, this is you and Lindsay. I don't know if you remember your. Yeah, it's all about the headband on this one. Okay. Yes. Okay. Wait, okay. Okay. You remember me? Oh, she remembers me. You remember me? Oh, she remembers me. Do you remember me? Oh, she remembers me. <laughs> yeah, that man. Sounds, that sounds good. There, there it is. There he is. And hey, now, listen. If you got an Ezekiel reference, because I could probably get yeah. closer on that too. I just remember that that was the original inspiration when I was auditioning and reading. Mm -hmm. It was it was kind of like the epitome of the ho Canadian hoser character. Oh. But he was much Ezekiel was a man of few words, as I recall. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He there harder, harder to pull up a reference on him, probably. But yeah, let's see. OK, let me. Pull, sorry about that. No, okay. I mean, the one not, scene. Not here. I mean, this is like I'm the one that's supposed to know this. I was the one that did this, but you know, I mean, you're helping me out. It's a team. It's a team effort yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> the one scene I remember, like to remember Ezekiel was the scene. Remember how he said the comments about women? I'll be more that girls. Girls are not that smarter than guys. Guys are more smart. I'll be more saying that. You know, listen. I can promise you that was writing. That I, I had nothing. Yeah, I know. This, I know. Is, this is this is this is, this is we, we've got to get the writer on the phone. This is not you, appropriate. Okay, but uh, but uh, but let you know, let's let's sit here. Okay, it's loading. Well, I just don't get why we lost, eh? Oh yeah. Wants to have six girls. Right. What's well, I just don't problem? get why we lost, eh? That's right. Oh yeah, that's right. I, he was kind of like a hoser, eh? But you know yeah. what else he sounds like a bit? Is he kind of reminds me because I grew up in Alberta, eh? And in Alberta, like sometimes we'd kind of like as a kid you'd kind of like make a joke about like you'd hear that sound a lot in alberta eh? like out in the outside outskirts of the cities eh? you'd hear that sound eh? like around the hockey rink see eh? <laughs> wow i'm sorry wow <laughs> that's it's funny because um that is that um that is that that really is literally in animation that's mm. how when you go to a record session, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. They wow. play you the reference mm -hmm. uh, at the very beginning of a show. It's based on the audition that they like. Wow. But for, for most often, until mm -hmm. you really kind of like latch onto that role, uh -huh. they will play you a reference. And then you are kind of matching that. You kind of get into that tone. And then you can kind of say whatever, eh? like it doesn't matter because once you got it, then you're kind of like, oh yeah, eh? I, I, okay, that's that guy. So now, what's the script? I can say it. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. You know, that's, it's it's yeah. kind of, uh, and I, I think, I think because they're in animation that these characters are so bold that it's kind yeah. of like it's easy to slide back from that sound and get closer to your own voice again if you're not really you know when you're, you're trying to think of a few things you're trying to look at the script you're trying to think about like the um you're obviously trying to listen to you who you're acting with you're trying to think about the voice of this character and then also you're trying to imagine physically what's happening because in yeah. most instances you're recording before there's any animation obviously so not in all instances but in most instances you are and um and so you're trying to think about all these things. And sometimes it's it's easy to have that voice slip a, slip off of that, of that, which is where an amazing voice director comes into play and um and is like really tuned into like what that should that sound should be. They're also trying to bear uh, bear in mind all of the things that you are as well, but they're they're the ones sort of going, ah, sliding off of that tone. We got to go back. Let's listen to it again. You know, oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. 
So it's it's yeah. kind of uh, simply by the fact that I really can't remember those sounds very well. You have to play me a reference, but that is really how it would work. I would show up oh. after not being maybe hadn't recorded in a couple of weeks, and oh. then and then they would sort of like play a reference, and you go like, oh yeah, okay, yep, got it, okay, good, good, good. So let's try it. Let's do it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Nice. Sorry about that, Peter. Sorry. <laughs> no, listen, I love it, man. I mean, I uh, it's uh, I I you know it's I I sincerely. I don't mind it one bit. I always just sort of feel like with fans that really know the show very well, I sort of go like, oh, I just hope they don't think it's like, what is this guy? He doesn't remember what it sounds like. But it's like I it's, understand because it's years ago. I it's it is it is years ago. And and also it's um um there's a lot of over the years, lots of different shows, lots of different roles. And yeah. and, and I mean, uh, you know, total drama is one of those handful of shows that really struck a chord that people really love so it's I'm, I'm not sort of saying it's like oh yeah no there's just so many shows but it's like you do over the years there's a lot of different voices a lot of different characters mm -hmm. that you play and you know you live in them while you're with them and then it's sort of easy to kind of like forget like it's it's crazy but you, you think of um at the time you know you're just you're inhabiting these roles you're playing with this you're you're really living mm -hmm. in it and uh, a bit of time goes by and it's sort of like oh yeah Oh, that's right. I did that that project. That was such a cool time, and that was like such a cool role. And I love the people that I got to work with. And it's always the case, but it's just kind of like you know, mm -hmm. it, it's it's hard mm -hmm. to always pull up like uh, you know which uh, pull up all of those experiences at times. It's kind of funny, yeah. Your normal voice though sounds like Cody. Your normal voice? It's not oh. it, honestly. It's really not far off. And there's, it, yeah. I find it's interesting in animation. I always found that there's kind of two schools of uh, two takes on, uh, on uh, animation, I would sort of very crudely break it down into that way, which is that some animation, what they really want is really very close to your own natural voice. Wow. If not your own voice, they want it very close to your own natural voice. And then there are other animated shows that are like, we want this to be really, really, character it can be a real departure from your tone and it's interesting because it really is you know there's there's variation within that but it's like that's really kind of how it's broken down sometimes you'll wow. you'll see an audition that you're reading for and they'll be like don't want any character voices your mm -hmm. own voice your own tone and some go like you know we want this to be this is true true animation true cartoon <laughs> real you know go crazy with it. we can hear whatever voice is inspired by this can be really out there. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting. It's kind of, um, you know, I think of it in that way, but for some roles, they really are very close to your own natural voice because probably yeah. in truth, those characters are maybe their storyline and their perspective and their, uh, their uh, experience. It maybe it aligns kind of closer to my own, like, you know, yeah. like I'm, oh. I'm closer to that character mm -hmm. than let's say, mm -hmm. You know, then then let's say this guy, you know, who I'm not as close to, you know. <laughs> wow. Now, of your three characters from Total Drama, who's your yeah. favorite? Yeah. Oh, I got to say Cody. Cody. I got to say Cody. You know, I mean, I think he was the character that I got to voice the most in the series. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. but also just like, you know, I I I. I love there's a, uh, a humanity to his character. He is the underdog. Yeah. He's like you, you root for him. And really, I will say, you know, I, I, I have lots of people reach out and specifically mm -hmm. about Cody, you know, and, and just to say like that they love that, that they love that role and that they're the, that character and that they, yeah. they want to connect and, and, you know, I've messaged back and mm -hmm. forth with people over the years uh, about uh, him. And I just think there's something about him that kind of strikes a chord with, with folks. I mean, he is, he's like, he's like, he's the underdog who kind of is, you just, you, you, you are kind of fighting for him a bit you know you want right. you want you want yeah. good stuff for cody he wants it for himself it's just that it, he's he's not sort of like the the coolest uh the the coolest kid out there but he's like kind of you know he's yeah. he, he he wants stuff for himself yeah. you root for him you want him he, i think we recognize ourselves a lot most of us recognize ourselves a lot in somebody like cody you know what i mean you're kind of doing yeah. your best yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. Nice. now uh favorite 
character other than Cody, Tyler, or Ezekiel. Yeah. Is your favorite other than those three? On the show? Yes. It's got to be Gwen. Come on. She was, yeah. that's who, that's who, that's, that's who I was, that's who I was in love with. That's who Cody was, you know, he's always pining for Gwen. How could I, how could I not choose Gwen? It would be, it would be offensive not to. <laughs> yeah, go to choose your crazy fancier. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> now, listen, did you have you interviewed her? Which Gwen? Yep. Yes. Megan Fallenbach. Yes. Yeah. And you know what? Megan and I um, socially were great friends before working on that show. Wow. Like, yeah, yeah. Like we we knew each other really well and were really like really um, great pals uh before the show after the show and it's true of like a lot of people that were on that show you know the comedy scene and the acting scene and the voice the voice acting scene in particular yeah, there's a there's a real kind of uh i'm not going to say small club but there's like there's a, a a group of familiar faces that in toronto that you would see uh when you would show up to do a record session and so a lot of us knew each other know each other had known each other before that show mm -hmm. um sometimes you would record in ensemble they would say which is like when you are reading with the other people in your scene and sometimes you record by yourself you know it really kind of depends on the the circumstance for what people's schedules are like and the rest of it but whenever you get a chance to record ensemble that was always my preference you know it's kind of like cool to be able to read with the other performers and actors and you know um be able to maybe improvise a little bit uh you know that was always like that's always the treat but yeah um um so i'm gonna say gwen so gwen. for my good pal megan i'm gonna say gwen <laughs> <laughs> favorite total drama season oh gosh season one i gotta go i the original and i only because um i would say like I just remember how unique a show that was um, when it first, uh, what you know, the the concept behind that show. And so I'll go season one, even though Cody, I, I probably preferred, I probably preferred the storyline of Cody in later seasons. But I, I, I'll say season one because it's like it was the original. It was what started the nice. whole thing off. It's like it was, it was very unique at that time, and it really, it really did just kind of it really found an amazing audience. So I got to say like right from right out of the gates that, that that was the concept of the show. I got to like say, that's pretty amazing. So let's go season one. Nice. I like world tour and I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. World tour was pretty cool. I had, yeah, that was pretty awesome too. Like I, I thought yeah. that was a pretty cool, a pretty cool. Um, yeah. It's a pretty cool concept. I, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Okay, now if you, I don't know if you know what happened to Ezekiel. Like you know, like he turned like green and gross looking. Like what happened to the poor? <laughs> I know. I don't know. I honestly, I have not sure. Our poor, our poor darling Ezekiel. I really don't know what occurred to him. I'm trying to. I, I and I can't even remember at the time. I feel like I, I had asked what the what what in the world was going on, but I don't know. I never got. I never got an answer for it. So I'm, I'm not sure what happened to our good friend. <laughs> it's like he like. Like over the seasons, like it was like a little, not like off, like not in, like like a joke, but like a little insight, like yeah, thing, you know, like, like I don't, I don't know if it was just kind of like maybe that was their little Easter egg kind of thing for uh, fans to be. I'm not sure. <laughs> it was like how he he like lost all his hair, basically, except like little strands. And like, yeah. Like, wow. Maybe maybe the artists were kind of just you know seeing how far they could continually go with it <laughs> before <laughs> before it was like what what is happening. Yeah, I mean, like you've been voted off first multiple times, and then yeah, got, like poor guy. <laughs> it's not fair. It's yeah. not fair. All he needed was to just last a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe he'll off. You heard this? The two new seasons, maybe him, yeah. Cody or Tyler come back. Listen, I mean, all are a possibility, and it's like uh, I feel as though it would only be it would be just desserts to have Ezekiel you know stick around for more than like the first episode yeah <laughs> yeah he just wins the whole season right he comes it would be back amazing yeah. it's his turn yeah like you need joe you got to talk to somebody you got you got to talk to the writers here joe look you're the first interview i've done about this and probably the only one i ever will so i mean only interviewer
So it's just it's just us. You call me, you call me, I'm in. Anybody else? Sorry, I'm exclusively I'm Joe Scoop on this. So <laughs> <laughs> now, if you were really on an island, mm-hmm. what three famous people, dead or alive, would you bring with you? Oh my gosh! Well. I mean, I better bring my wife and daughter, but we're, we'll set them aside. We'll just assume they're traveling with me, uh, you know, because they're not fame. Well, there's, you know, they're in, uh, uh, they're in varying levels of fame, but they're there. They're with me. Okay. They're in the thatched roof hut, uh, probably sitting out on chairs uh, by the beach, uh, kicking it. Uh, but famous, three famous people, dead or alive. Well, I, I mean, I would say Peter Sellers. I'm going to say Peter Sellers. Okay. Um, Although I don't know what, you know, I'm not sure what he would, I just want to, I think I'd, I'd want to talk to him. Um, and I will say Martin Short, because okay. um, Martin Short, probably on SCTV, I, I probably mm-hmm. saw myself and the characters and the stuff that I like to do, maybe lining up closer to his level of mm-hmm. energetic craziness. Uh, mm-hmm. So I will say him. Okay. Uh, because I, I'm, and the other thing is, is that he always seems to me to be like, um, he would probably be pretty funny on a desert island Nice, <laughs> and probably, yeah. probably yeah. not too like some comedians, yeah. uh, can be kind of a bit sort of, uh, darker, bit more down, bit more mm-hmm. on the, uh, you know, cutting negative side of things that would not be Martin Short. So I would sort of feel like stuck on a desert island. He'd still go, hey, there's coconuts. We're fine. Oh, there's coconuts. Okay, we'll be great. Whereas, you know, some other comedians would be sort of like, (laughs) maybe not enjoying the experience as much. And then uh, another famous, um, I mean, for no reason, I'm thinking somebody from Baywatch in case there's a drowning incident so that someone can save us. So I don't, maybe, uh, but that, but I really don't have, I don't, I don't think I'd want to be on an island with any one of them, but maybe just somebody that could save us. And then, so who would it be? Well, I think Baywatch, isn't it Pamela Anderson? Pamela Anderson. Yes. Yes. And she's Canadian. Um, (laughs) I don't think I ever would have imagined myself saying Pamela Anderson on a desert island, but I'm. I'm, for, I'm sure for some people that would be number one, but I'm going to say Pamela Anderson in case there's a drowning incident. Uh, she'll, you know, channel uh, some of her uh, lifeguard skills from that a seminal show uh, and be able to save either myself, Martin Short, uh, Peter Sellers, or my wife and daughter. So hopefully, hopefully that she would simply be there to be sitting on a lifeguard chair. And every now and again, we'd morning, Pamela, morning, Peter. How's the surf today? It's it's the undertow is a little dangerous. I think I'd I'd stay on, on the sand. Okay, thank you. Have a nice day. Have you got sunscreen? Okay, good, good. Nice, nice. We'll go something like that. <laughs> and you know, I uh, this goes back a little ways, but mm-hmm. I did when I was performing at the Second City mm-hmm. myself and my good pal Pat Kelly. Um, we got to do a little comedy sketch mm-hmm. for. Uh, Martin Short. He had Ooh. come up into Toronto. This was back when he was doing the Martin Short show. Him mm-hmm. and his manager, a guy named Bernie Brillstein, they had come up to Toronto to uh, the smaller uh, comedy uh, venue in the second city. It was called the um, uh, Tim Sims Playhouse, which was sort of like the smaller alternative mm-hmm. stage at the second city in Toronto. Wow. And um, they had come up to basically scout talent. And I remember it was a long evening of comedians, uh, sketch performers. Um, and my buddy and I, Pat and I, were on really kind of close to the end. And we were like, oh, geez, this is going to be like a long show. And I mean, geez, is it, it's, you know, I don't know if is it going to be, how's it going to feel by the time you get to like hour three of this cavalcade of people saying like, pick me. And, uh, and so anyways, we were on close, closer to the end and you know what Martin short had been in and out of the theater. Cause it's like a long thing. And so he had come back in with Bernie Brillstein mm-hmm. just before my buddy and I got on stage. Ooh. And as I remember, we were really excited. We were pretty, you know, we were, we were kind of green 
um, at the Second City at that time. We weren't sort of like part of the main stage cast or anything like that. We were sort of like newer performers there. Um, and it was just one of those, it honestly was one of those magical nights. Is any time you talk to like comedy performers, whatever, there's like every now and again, there's these nights or these performances, there are these moments that you sort of go like, gosh, it just everything kind of aligned. And it was like really, it was really like just a cool moment. And, and that was, that was this night, you know, we, we really, it was a warm audience. We both sort of felt like nice. the timing. I, I think, I think hearing that Martin had stepped back in the theater with Bernie Brillstein, we were both like, oh my God, he's sitting out there, man. And I was like, that's like, that's my guy. That's who I, that's, that's why I'm doing any of this stuff. He's like, he's part of that. I'm that's, that's that guy. And oh. so we were just like, so you know jazzed about this and we came out and we just had like had the best time doing these ridiculous characters who were uh, we had both grown up in the united church in canada we were basically our characters were um just reading announcements uh to the congregation just silly kind of announcements that you know we were sort of doing these kind of you know quiet soft gentle characters and uh, reading the bulletin announcements uh, for this week for the congregation and uh you know it was just kind of a character thing but it we really we uh we loved it and wow. as it turned out we then were after the fact it went well and they reached out and were like can you send us some samples of your writing and oh, at the wow. time my buddy and i were like we haven't written anything. <laughs> we just like, we just do our own sketches and we kind of improvise and we, you know, so then we're like, let's try to write some stuff. So we like wrote down two or three sketches, I think, and sent them down their way, probably well after the deadline. Cause we didn't have anything. And that was the last we heard of it, but it was, I, wow. I, I still won't forget that night though. We sort of felt like we did ourselves proud in front of someone that we cared a lot about. And we were like, no matter what, that was a good night. That was a good night. That was a, nice. a good night. Yeah. Over the years of your career, do you still keep in touch with co-stars and directors you work with? Obviously. Yeah, all the time. Of oh. course. I mean, in this last, uh, well, and uh, I, because half of my career, I, I was performing and working out of Toronto and now for the last I don't know, 13, 14 years I've been really in this, in the States. I mean, um, that I definitely keep in touch with, uh, some people, um, some people, you know, most of my closest friends are, are people that I have met from performing, from doing comedy, from doing, you know, film, television, animation, most of them from doing second city. Um, you know, most of my closest friends are people that I've met in performing in that way you know and then i i definitely have like a couple others that i went to high school with and elementary school with and all that stuff that it's like they never pursued entertainment but it's like you know they're my oldest friends too but i but then mostly it's like people that i've met in the industry you know who would you say is the coolest person you have worked with the coolest Ooh, my gosh you know um oh my goodness I have had the chance to work with some pretty crazy folks. I mean, like, I, I don't mean crazy, but I just mean like, you know, people who, who, um, I don't know that, that maybe I've, I've seen a lot of their work, you know, coolest. I mean, like I did get to work with Harrison Ford and That's Liam Neeson on a, uh, movie a long time ago, a submarine movie. And I mean, Harrison Ford is like, it's a pretty cool dude. Yeah. <laughs> like, like he's a pretty cool dude. Um, and, uh, I got to work with Bill Macy a long time ago as well. Like, um, yes. on a movie called, um, what was it called again? It'll come back to me in a minute, but he was, oh my God, this guy, uh, you know, he, he was, he was, this was, this was around when he was doing the original Jurassic parks. I think this is, this is, oh. this dates back. This was one of the first That's kind cool. of gigs that I had with somebody that I sort of felt was like a bit of a, like an acting kind of like mm -hmm. uh, icon icons, not quite the right term, but it's like somebody who I was like, Oh my gosh, somebody that I really admired, somebody that I really admired nice. because this is, this was a little bit earlier on in, in his career. I mean, at the time when I worked with Harrison Ford, the guy was an icon. He was like, you know, the guy, the guy was like, this is Harrison Ford for God's sakes. But, yeah. um, 
this was a little bit earlier on in Bill Macy's career, but somebody who I was just like, oh my goodness, like he is, he is just top tier. This is, this is an actor. No. And I remember walking into the makeup trailer and him and me saying, oh, I don't think I said anything. Cause I was like, I'm not going to say hi to him. Oh my God, it's William H. Macy. And um, so he was like, Hey, morning. How you doing? And I was like, oh, morning, Mr. Macy. He's like, come me, Bill, come me, Bill, come me, Bill. And oh. uh, you want to read this thing? You want to read this thing? And I was like, yeah, yeah. So we, you know, kind of go through our scene together and, and we're, then we're in and filming this scene and, and it was a really, it was a really cool moment. Like basically him mm -hmm. catching up with an old friend that had sort of known him from back mm -hmm. in the day. And he's kind of, he's a bit down in his luck in this movie. The movie was called Focus. And um, he was, he was a bit of down in his luck at the, at the time. And, um, you know, kind of looking for, I don't know, looking for any leads on work possibilities mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. And um, we go through the scene, but it's just a nice little two-hander back and forth for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, he asks me after we're, after we're done, like the first kind of read through take of it, he's like, how does it feel to you? What do you, th how do you think this is going? And I was like, what? Oh, he's like, yeah, what, what do you think? What do you think? I was like, I, I, I think it, I think it feels like it's pretty, I think it feels good. He's like, yeah, yeah, I do too. I think this is really nice. It's a nice, comfortable. <laughs> I was like, I was like, you're Bill Macy. You're asking me. I, I, I have no idea. I remembered all my words. I guess that's good. But it, it just kind of speaks to like, what a cool guy he is. Here he is, who is like, got this, um, yeah, he's just a really notable actor. And he's asking some kid who's kind of like new to the game. You know, what's your take on this? How do you think this is going? You got any thought? You got any notes for me? And I was like, no, no notes for you. <laughs> I'm just trying not to pee my pants. <laughs> got no notes for you. <laughs> it's like the Wayne's World, you know, Wayne's World moment. Like, I'm not with that. Exactly, exactly. Oh, but I, look, I'll give a shout out to another one of my buddies who is like, and this is somebody who is, uh, who is one of my, one of my close friends. And oh. Uh, his name is Luke Kirby. Luke you heard Kirby. of this guy? So he is on the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, and he okay. plays Lenny Bruce. On, oh, on, yes, yeah, okay. my good buddy Luke Kirby, and uh, for which he won an Emmy. Um, wow. and he's he's just an amazing actor, he's just an amazing actor. Mm -hmm. There's no two ways about it, but. When you ask who's the coolest person I have worked with, we've been buddies for a long time. But there is something about that Luke Kirby that he is just a cool dude. Nice. Luke Kirby is like pretty unflappable. He kind of has his, has a swagger about him. Mm. He's a cool nice. dude. He's a cool dude. So I'm going to say, even though like, I mean, honestly, like, we're good pals. So it's pretty funny to say like, you know, this guy's pretty cool, but he's like, he's my buddy. But so I'm going to, but I'm going to shout out. I'm going to give his name out there because Luke Kirby, my buddy, that's a cool dude. He's a cool dude. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you said uh, Liam Neeson, Harrison Ford, I think yeah. Lai Gan Jin and Han Solo. Sorry. Cause I like Star Wars. Yeah. I'm telling you. And actually Liam Neeson, you know, I, I probably had a closer connection to Liam Neeson than to Harrison. Mm -hmm. uh, like just over the course of working on this movie, it was called K-19, The Widowmaker. And it was, that was Catherine Bigelow, um, uh, who this was early year on in her career. And um, she was amazing too. I mean, she's, 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 uh, she's just an amazing director, a very, uh, very intelligent, very, she has an um, unbelievable eye for, sort of um putting together beautiful pictures as well like i mean uh, that she was just this unbelievable person to be able to to get a chance to work with but both harrison and liam and liam is just like again like just the coolest nice. nicest like honestly just down to earth easy going cool oh. um, humble guy and it you know it, it that that would really be the case nine times out of ten with most people when they're kind of people that have been in the public eye that you've either gotten a chance to meet through 
they're in entertainment or whatever it is, nine times out of 10, honestly, the, the people that I've had the opportunity to work with doesn't matter if they're crazy big celebrities or they're mm-hmm. starting out in their career or somewhere in between. It really doesn't matter. Nine times out of 10, these are really interesting, amazing people, you know, uh, mm-hmm. who have made the choice to kind of pursue something that they're passionate about and mm-hmm. that enjoy entertaining people. I mean, if you kind of boil it yeah. down to that, it's like a lot of those people are, you know, pretty interesting, approachable nice people who are looking to share themselves you know they're they're performing they're performing nice. they they are looking to share themselves to to reveal elements of their of their experience of the human experience mm-hmm. you know if that is the voice that speaks to you you're probably a pretty interesting compelling approachable uh kind-hearted uh person who is also pretty grateful mm-hmm. that you get to wake up every day doing what you absolutely love and finding a way for that to happen. And mm-hmm. it's like, you know, uh, not in all cases, every now and again, you meet somebody and you go like, Oh my goodness, what in the world? What, what they're, they're so angry or they're so, they're so uh, distant or miserable. And that is that occasionally, very rarely occasionally happens. And you're like, oh. Whoa, that's crazy. But nine times out of 10, it's like just the nicest, interesting um, people that would choose to pursue the arts that are passionate about it, that like to, that like Mm -hmm. to um, consume of the arts, Mm -hmm. watch things, go to theater, you know, listen to live music, go like, you know, if you're a a fan of those things, if you pursue those things, if you're invested in the arts, there's something kind of great about that, that it's like, yeah, you're, you're an interesting person that, that this is the world that speaks to you. I, I like that. I like that. What director would you say taught you the most is mm. the director you want to work with? Mm-hmm. And hmm. Um well, you know, in voice, in voice, in voiceover. Okay. Um there uh let me just think here for a second. Um there's a director in voiceover, her name is Deb. Toffin, Deborah Toffin. Okay. And I don't know. I'm I'm trying to remind myself if she worked on um Total Drama. I can't remember, but she I think she, I think she did. That's why the name sounds so familiar. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I'll tell you what, I probably That's learned the most awesome. um yeah. in voiceover from her because okay. she is she is a very sharp um mm-hmm. very um clear director she's also somebody that doesn't suffer fools so in other words it's like she kind of expects you to get there know your stuff and be able to deliver mm-hmm. and it's like mm-hmm. i think in some level i felt like once the first couple times that i had worked with her i was kind of rattled because it wasn't like lucy goosey easy breezy like it was she was very direct and she was very focused and knew exactly what she wanted and and was sort of like not not sort of wanting to waste time on somebody who wasn't prepared somebody that didn't know what she was kind of like you know talking about like in some level you needed to have some real foothold in what animation is and what performing for animation is in performing voice in like and all of those things. And so it really, the first couple of times that I'd worked with her, I was kind of rattled because it was like, whoa, this she's she's really asking me to step up what I do and be very specific with it. You know wow. what I mean? And to be prepared to like get in there. And it's like, we're doing this. And um, so I would say, and since then I've had the opportunity to work with her many times. And and I, I really appreciate how... Um, I really appreciate the specificity that she brings to it. And also that I sort of feel like I knew that I was doing something kind of well when it was like on some level having Deb's approval a little bit, you know, because she, 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 she was somebody that, as I say, I was kind of like at the beginning, a little bit more uh, kind of rattled at like, uh, can I keep up? Can I keep up with what is being asked of me here? Can I, can I, you know, perform what is being asked right now and and sort of to to kind of win her f- approval and favor and that really kind of made me feel like hey i 
I'm doing what I am meant to be doing in animation stuff. And I can kind of, I can kind of hang with anybody in this space because she demands excellence and doesn't sort of suffer fools. And I sort of feel like for that reason, it kind of, it asked me to kind of be prepared in a different way in animation. So I would say, I think I, I learned uh, an awful lot from her in that. And then in the live action way, Dave Thomas directed us in that movie, um, White mm -hmm. Coats. Uh, and I, I mean, I just learned so much from him. And, you know, one of the greatest things that, that Dave did was he really wanted us to bring, to be equally collaborative and to bring mm -hmm. a sense of fun in everything that we're doing. So it was like, he was at the helm of this ship, but he was also kind of like saying like, this is, this is going to be fun. Like we're going to have fun doing this. If it's not mm -hmm. fun, there's no point. Like in, in some yeah. level you need to have cultivate this, uh, this level of play and mm -hmm. bring that to doing this type of comedy work together. And the fact that he was uh, somebody who I had admired his work for years, who was a comedy legend in my mind and so many other people's minds. Um, you know, I, I, I loved getting a chance to work with him in that way. I would work with him in, and I have in many other ways since, but I, I would say that that allowed me to kind of bring the most free, playful spirit to comedy. I just sort of felt welcome to do so in the presence of somebody who was like, that I had looked up to for such a long time. So that was an amazing experience. And someone that I want to work with, oh man, you know, I just think that there's so many, there's just so many incredibly talented directors. And there's also so many people that don't even, nobody even, they're not even, they're not even known yet. You know, I, I feel like the person that I really am excited to work with is somebody who is deeply passionate about whatever their project is that is deeply passionate about it. That isn't just like showing up and being a jerk and, and calling it in, but somebody who's like really cares about getting together and collectively making something that is just like next level. And whoever that is, it doesn't matter if this is the first project they've ever done, if they've been doing it forever. It's like, that's, that's, that's inspiring to be in around somebody who is really kind of like, passionate in that way. And that also wants us to be a collectively cool experience. You know, I, mm -hmm. I feel like those out of, out of that comes something magic you hope, because um, there's just so many factors that play into what the end result is. And I think one of the big ones is everybody involved should be kind of like creatively connected to it and, and welcome mm -hmm. to bring the absolute best of what they can to it. And you just see what you get in the end. So, yeah. Nice. Now, and you might you mentioned this earlier. If you didn't go into like voice acting or acting, mm. what you would have done as a career, and what other hobbies do you have or interests besides those? Well, gosh, you know, I, I really don't. You know, I don't know. I really don't know. Mm. I don't know what I would do. I mean, um, I do love the outdoors. Like where I grew up in mm. Calgary is kind of in the foothills of the mountains, and skiing is a big thing. Uh, camping, like canoeing, kayaking, whitewater rafting. Like, as I say, my dad mm. had this whitewater rafting company. Honestly, if I did not pursue uh, comedy, comedy, improv, voiceover, acting, mm -hmm. um, I have this sneaking suspicion it would have been something done in the outdoors. And I don't really know what, but I was such a, mm. I loved, I loved guiding these rafts it was whitewater rafts um nice. on the upper panther river the upper red deer river in in alberta and i like passionately love that i love camping i really don't mind the cold i like i like the outdoors oh. i mean wow. quite honestly you know it's like i as as unusual as it would seem i may have found something more in outdoor adventure mm. i don't even know what it would be i mean you know, clearly you can run a rafting company. Someone can, maybe I could have done that or I could, you know, maybe I would have pursued something like that or like outdoor. Um, I won't go as far as to say survival stuff. Cause I'm not really sort of like into like particularly, 
I've never really hunted, but I could imagine like I do love the outdoors, tents, camping, um, some survival ish things, you know, like how to survive, I suppose. So I don't I don't know. Would I be on um, alone? The I don't know if you heard of this te television show alone. It's like a they send, send 10 or 12 survivalists out into the really? out into the wilderness and they see how long you can last with basically whatever's in your backpack. Uh, I don't know if I'd be that bold, but I, but maybe <laughs> I love that show. Uh, maybe that <laughs> favorite band and or artist and type of music you like. Oh, interesting. Um, you know, uh, favorite band. Sheesh. I kind of like, you know, alternative music. Like, so out here, for instance, Okay. I would listen to KCRW in the morning. Morning becomes eclectic. It is okay. you can stream it on on um, like online. You go to kcrw.com and you can stream their morning becomes eclectic. They also have something called um, Eclectic Twenty Four, which is just this always streaming uh, eclectic um, music uh, mm -hmm. channel that they mm -hmm. have. And I love the diversity of musicians and sounds that they play on that show they always curate and find um uh really interesting uh musicians and really interesting uh sort of like yes yeah, songs musicians bands whatever i i will tell you there is um <laughs> see this is something this is something that just is more very recently that i heard on there and i was like what who is this who is this a guy who goes by the name the bulgarian car trader bulgarian mm -hmm. car trader look up golden rope bulgarian car trader this guy uh -huh. is so i because i just heard this song i've heard it like two or three times on on kcrw and i was like what is this it's really got this really cool listenable uh, sound to it and i look up this guy he is driving around berlin uh -huh. with a laptop and a microphone and he recorded like four songs uh -huh. that you can find on youtube and i think he's also got it on spotify and that's it like he's not i don't wow. know how i don't know how this guy like i don't know how kcrw found him he probably sent out an email so i found him on like instagram and i was like i friended him i saw like even on this even on this huh. this youtube video of huh. him uh driving around it's hilarious he's doing like a little private concert in his in his it's like a 1991 mercedes like he, he sets the whole thing wow. he's like i'm driving in my you know 1991 mercedes s class or something. i can't remember what he said it's something crazy and it's probably got i don't know 2500 views on youtube but it, it's it's like so it's just so crazy but it, so i'm going to say him because i want i want you to go and find this guy i want other people to go and uh look up the bulgarian car trader look up golden rope take a listen to it watch this video but i think that is so inspiring someone who is I don't know. His his recording oh. studio is a car that he's driving around in. And I did a little bit of research, not that I was like sort of, you know, trying to um, uh, like stalk this guy, but I did a little bit of research and it sounded like he, he lives in Berlin with his family. Mm. And I think that maybe there's kids. And all I could think about is like, maybe he's got kids. The only quiet place he has that he can go and record his music is in his car because the kids are noisy in the house or in the apartment so he gets in his car and that's his sound studio and he just like wow. sings and drives and it's like that's just such a cool thing and it's 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 one of those amazing things that of this time that we live in that yeah. you got some music that you wrote you have a microphone laptop you can do a lot you can you can yeah. you can be heard you know like here we are having this conversation you're in chicago i'm in los angeles you're outside of chicago i'm outside of los angeles and um um you know here we are we're making this thing it wouldn't it wouldn't we wouldn't have been able to do this in the same way many years ago it's so yeah. it's kind of like being able to find different performers people uh whatever you want is is such an amazing thing so look up bulgarian car trader that is my final answer golden rope take a look you will find it you will think it's 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 just so cool it's just like 
here's just this guy making his making his music in his car. I mean, I don't know if you could legally do that in the U.S. because you're not really supposed to be on a phone. So I don't know if you can be recording yeah. And, yeah. and driving. But, you know, it, there was no there was no accidents. So he was doing it safely, was safely recording from his car. My, my mom like showed me like 80s music, my big 80s music. Yeah. Oh, well, who's your favorite? OK, my favorite band of all time, they're yeah. 70, 80s, 90s, and their lead singer passed away in the 90s. Do you know the band? 70s 80s 90s lead singer passed away in the 90s yes uh kurt cobain no oh okay well at least i at least i he did pass away in the 90s yeah um there if it helps they have so many hits a lot of hits oh my goodness they're british it helps they're british hmm. gosh the lead singer passed away in the nineties, nineteen ninety one or ninety two, I think. I want to that. Mm. I know that there's so many like music files who are just like saying like, "You moron! <laughs> you should know this." Oh my god, does he not know music? <laughs> um, I don't know who is it. Queen. Oh, come on! Of course. You know, of you, course. You know Queen Peter. I'm oh my gosh, show. do I ever? Freddie Mercury. Yes. I mean, what a voice. Yes. I know. That right? guy. That guy. What a voice. Yeah. What a great, great band to be your favorite band. Can I also say them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like Queen. Like you know, like you said, Freddie, like yeah, like a unique voice, you know, like oh my vocal range too. Absolutely know. nobody like him, right? Absolutely mm -hmm. nobody like him. I mean, just a gift that it was like I mean, really, there's nobody yeah. like him. That that is truly remarkable. Yeah. Wow, very, very cool. Thank you. I actually got to meet their guitarist and drummer because they still tour. Really? Yes. Oh my gosh. We, uh where it was a concert here in 2017 oh my gosh good for you man that's cool like, and they, how, who who was who was who was their lead singer he they're still touring with him uh am lambert do you know am lambert? oh yeah of course yeah that's what i thought right he i mean that guy's got a pretty impressive range too i mean how did it sound did it sound like pretty pretty not pretty bad. close not bad Okay. Yeah, it's not Freddie Mercury, but come oh, yeah, on. Yeah, he's he's uh yeah, he's not replaceable. But yeah. Adam Lampert, I can see being about as close as close as someone is gonna be able to sort of have that kind of range. I can see that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh -huh. When Brian like guitar's like he's like freakishly tall, so yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um I you know, I who did I I was just out the who did I just see? Uh, it'll, it'll come to me in a second. It'll be it'll be back. But I, I saw someone at a grocery store just as you said that, and I was like, "Oh yeah, oh my god, I gotta say this." It's a, a wonderful grocery store encounter I had. But it's, Did you it's see Brian May? Yes, yes, that's who it was. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he was he was fondling the um, celery, looking for a firm uh, celery stock. Uh, was him so anyways that's the end of the story but he, he did find that celery yeah. i think he's a big juice fan so <laughs> well if it comes to you <laughs> yes yes yeah. yes okay favorite sports and favorite teams do you like sports peter mm, you're, i do i do you like hockey since you're uh i do like hockey calgary flames come yeah. on i mean right. that's my hometown i got to i got to um i had uh i had a crazy experience with the calgary flames a long time ago okay. i had done a commercial for bud light hmm. and it was there's no point in going into the details of this commercial but this it, this commercial for whatever reason hmm. kind of became this cult hit commercial in calgary for bud light hmm. and apparently People were kind of like there was a there was a uh, it's all about this guy that was named Johnson who has this steaming mug of coffee and so his boss goes in and looks in Johnson's office and there's a steaming mug of coffee on his desk he's like oh Johnson's here burning the midnight oil and someone you know meanwhile um, the Johnson character is out like partying at a nightclub and you know so it's like it's the steaming cup of coffee that everyone's finding on his desk thing like oh he's here he's working hard and meanwhile he's like sleeping in and whatever mm -hmm. and so but it became this weird thing in calgary where people were really 
you know, everyone is sort of like uh, making jokes about the idea of Johnson. He's, you know, Johnson's out having a great time. So I get this phone call at the time I was working on a sketch comedy show in Los Angeles from the newspaper in Calgary saying like, hey, what do you think about your commercial being this crazy hit in Calgary? And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, everyone's talking about Johnson in this steaming mug of coffee. And I was like, I have no idea. I, I didn't know that. She's like, oh, yeah, it's it's all planned during the Stanley Cup. And and um, um, the people are just talking it up. And I was like, well, I, I do this interview with her. And I was like, listen, do me a favor. At the end of this article, would you please say if anybody, anybody wants to fly Johnson up to Calgary to be there for the Stanley Cup finals, I'd love to come. And sure enough, a bar owner in Calgary mm -hmm. uh, calls, flies me up to go and sit in game six of the Stanley Cup finals in his box in the Saddle Dome to cheer on the flames with um, with some other uh, comedy guys, uh, the Trailer Park Boys, who had a wow. show that was... Yes! Wow. So Bubbles and I were just hanging out in the box at the uh, at the Saddle Dome. <laughs> And, they, uh -huh. and it's so funny. I mean, the cat literally the camera comes over during the Stanley Cup finals. You know, the in in uh, stadium camera comes over and is like, "It's <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, it's Johnson and the and the Trailer Park Boys." We're like, "Yeah, Johnson!" Like it was so ridiculous. But so I got to go and cheer on the Flames, uh, who ended up losing uh, that mm -hmm. game. Uh, they could have, and actually they ended up losing the series. They, it went to seven and they lost to, um, who was it now? Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember who they're playing at the time. Uh, it wasn't, wasn't the Rockies. Anyways, doesn't matter. But, um, but um, they, yeah, they had the chance to win. And there was a goal that was, they had a chance to win in, in game six. And there was a goal that was allowed that probably shouldn't have been. And if it Ooh. hadn't been, it was like, yeah. Would have been maybe a different outcome anyways it was crazy but that's so i i, I will say the um stampeders or sorry i will say the flames and the stampeders uh as in uh football because calgary come on it's where it's, it's my hermitage nice and may i may if i find the clip on youtube i'll insert the clip when you talk do it if you can find yeah look up uh, johnson bud uh -huh. light steaming cup of coffee it lives somewhere i'm sure it does uh, everything's on youtube so yeah i'm sure it's all there you know You'll, you'll, and you'll sort of go, they flew you up to watch the Stanley Cup finals for that. <laughs> That's all I was thinking. I was like, of all the things that I've sort of like at that point had done, and I was working on some, you know, WB sketch comedy show that was like on Comedy Central and whatever else at the time. And I was like, this commercial and they fly me to the like, Stanley what? Cup. Great. Okay. I love yeah. it. That sounds Free amazing. Tickets, right? Free tickets, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Looks like Johnson's in early. Where's Johnson? I don't know. But there's a steaming cup of coffee on his desk. Johnson, burning the midnight oil again. <laughs> yeah, because I love hockey. And you might uh -huh. hate you, you might hate me though. What my favorite team is? It's not the Hawks. Not the Hawks. It's not the Oilers. No. Okay, because it's like the Battle of Alberta. That's that's all no. I was gonna say. No. Who? No. The Canucks. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I'll there's say a, it's I'll say it's better than the Oilers. There's a because reason that's for the big thing in Alberta. The Battle of Alberta. I mean, yeah. come on. The there's a reason though why. I'm a Canuck Why? Fan. When I was two years old, yeah, at the practice week in here in Chicago, one of their players, you know, Marcus Nelson. I don't know if you heard. Yeah, of, of course. I was calling Marcus, Marcus, Marcus. He comes over to me. You want this, buddy? He was a stick, and I, he gave me a stick. So. Oh my gosh! Okay, so, look. Okay, so I have one hockey story for you because you'll enjoy this. Okay. And that is that um, uh, a friend of a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Ingrid Cavallars, amazing actor. Huh. Her husband, Dallas Eakins, <gasps> uh, former player and then coach. The uh, now he coaches um, 
I think no. he's down in Anaheim, right? Yeah. And right. but at the time when I was living in Toronto, mm -hmm. uh, he was the assistant coach of the Leafs. Hmm. And so it was a he had a birthday celebration and Ingrid had asked if me and my buddy Pat would mm -hmm. kind of like MC his birthday. Like he had sort of a big Ooh. birthday celebration and uh -huh. she asked me to do. Um, oh, there's there's that guy uh, Lipton, James Lipton, who used to do the inside the actor's studio interviews. Yeah. Uh -huh. So she asked me to sort of like pretend to be like James Lipton and interview <laughs> Dallas on kind of like a, this is your life. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? At this yeah. thing. So needless to say it, we had a lot of fun, got to meet a lot of the players while we're trying to like put together wow. this, this video and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So afterwards Dallas to say, thank you mm -hmm. um, gets Pat and I tickets to a Leafs game. And so wow. we go and and um, I don't even remember who we were playing, who the Leafs were playing at the time, but they were on a bit of a losing streak. Watch mm -hmm. the game, have this great time. They win, they win this game. And so wow. then uh, Pat and I are like, "Oh, this is great." Ingrid's like, "Hey, you know what? Come on back and, and um, we'll go into like the players' club uh, at players' lounge or whatever it was, and and we'll mm -hmm. hang out. It was a celebration. Everyone's in good mood. It was Friday night." We hang out. Um, Dallas is talking to the head coach and Dallas is like, Hey, you know what? We won tonight. And uh, I invited my buddies here and the coach who was, was it, uh, was it Maurice LaMarche? Is that right? I can't he's remember. A voice, he's a voice actor. He's Oh yeah. Sorry. Then that's not him. <laughs> <laughs> who, was, who was the, who was the, who was the Leafs coach at the time? I click. Let me look up. Look, look, yeah, look. Let's look it up. Come on. Okay. We got it. This is like circa late nineties. Can you hear Come me? On. This is like, yeah, yeah, I can oh, hear my you. audio. Like, stop. <laughs> no, I can, I can hear. Okay. So you Boy, said so Maple much. Leafs. Yeah. yeah. Maple Leafs. What, would you, what was it, the nineties or nineties? Let me, is that right? Maybe, maybe early two thousands. It was like two thousands. Let's call it. Let's call it. Oh yeah. Not the nineties. It's like two thousands. Okay. I got the coach. Who do we got? It's loading. Sorry about that. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I let, you know, what's so funny is that I'm, I'm asking you to do it. I could also do this, but. <laughs> <laughs> all good uh, okay we got what, what would you say like early uh, pat quinn paul maurice paul maurice so, paul. That, so i say maurice lamarche okay <laughs> okay yes all good paul maurice so Former he, Jets coach, sorry okay yes there you go so he he says he says um he says to us that they win that night we're, we're celebrating with the, uh, the players dallas and he's like well you know what that means these guys are our lucky charms they're coming to the next game. Wow. And so Pat and I, uh -huh. for like four games in a row, were like the lucky charms for the Maple Leafs. We'd show up. We had these amazing seats. They'd win a game. We'd go back to the lounge. We're like hanging out with the players. We're like, we're back, baby. Yeah. Partying, having the best time. It was like game four that they lost, and we never heard from them again. <laughs> Oh, it was, it was so funny, but like mm -hmm. literally Paul Maurice was like, uh, yeah, he was like, he was like, yeah, there are lucky charms. See you at the next game. It was crazy. He's nice. He's nice. I'm like when he was with the Jets, he's a very nice guy too. Like a nice coach. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, he's a nice guy. And, and Dallas is an awesome guy too. Kind of had some bad luck in Edmonton there. Like, it, cause he was, he was coaching there for a little bit and had mm -hmm. like some amazing players but it just it didn't come together. But he's another really cool guy, like just an awesome, awesome guy. I, I, I did. You said Oilers. I did meet McDavid. Oh, you did? Yes. Oh, my. How was he? He's nice. He's, I could if you want me to show you a picture. So oh, yeah, see it. Okay. It's on my Instagram page. Sorry. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, come on. Let's see what we got. Let's see awesome. what we can do. Oh, if you can see. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. That's awesome cool. that awesome. was awesome 2018 pre-covid <laughs> whoa yeah yeah oh my gosh that's amazing that's totally awesome yeah. thank you sweet sweet okay. okay now what is your favorite food oh um i'm an alberta boy i'm gonna say steak okay nice that sounds good right now sorry yeah, <laughs> you can't you can't i mean you know you can't go wrong i'm it's you know it's uh, uh my wife is uh more of a vegetarian really hmm. so 
So usually when there's a steak in the house, it's it's me just eating it solo. But uh, you know, I I will. It's my Alberta roots. We're it's yeah. a, the Alberta. We're ranching. We're ranching people. I'm specifically not, but there's a lot of ranches around where I grew mm-hmm. up, and steak was always like you know that was the uh, that was yeah. the golden ticket. Now that the old things going back to normal, do you have any projects in the works that come up? Come you up? know, yeah, like um, there is a podcast that we uh, I had done with my good buddies um, Pat Kelly and Chris Kelly. And it's a comedy podcast called This Sounds Serious. And it really is basically a comedy sort of uh, version of like true crime podcast. So it's kind of like a magic because those true crime podcasts are like everywhere. And they're like, they're like, uh, it's such a huge sub genre in podcasting. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, well, let's do like a comedic version of this. Mm. Um, so we've done three seasons of this and oh. they're kind of like, if, if you like true crime, or even if you don't like true crime, but, and you like comedy, check out this sounds serious because I think you will love it. Especially if you, if you are familiar with true crime, it'll be like, you'll sort of recognize some of like the tropes of it, but it's a, it's a comedy fake, mm. totally fake uh storyline and it's a bit of a mystery and you know what i mean second thing but anyways we have been in development on this for a little over a year as a tv project it is with the network right now and we're just kind of waiting to find out what's going to happen so we're hoping that we get to do this because it's it's you know a pat like a passion project if you will that we it's it started out of something that we creatively just thought this would be a really funny show and then we made it as a podcast and people really kind of were attracted to it and listened to it and it it sort of did really well and and you know it got sort of uh, acknowledged by the new yorker as one of the best uh top 10 podcasts of the year i think wow. last year or the year before like so it's kind of it's kind of been floating out there a little bit and but anyway so we've been developing it as a TV show and man, I would love to do it because I think it would be really funny. I mean, think about something like an even crazier version of like the tiger King, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like that's kind of, that's kind of what it is, right? It's, it's like these crazy characters and an unbelievable story and all fake, all made up. So it's not, nobody got hurt. It's just a, a, a platform for comedy uh, for us anyways. So um, we've been kind of working on that, developing that and another another uh, podcast that I have developed with another group of people that we're trying to um, just right now sort of shop around to find a home for it. And it's basically um, uh, it kind of it, the launch pad for it is like those. You, you ever heard the next door app where people kind of are sharing posts about what's happening in their neighborhood? It's okay. like it's okay. kind of like we take those types of posts from things like next door or, or posts on like uh, online marketplaces or whatever they are and, and use those as like inspiration for comedic scenes. So it's uh, we'll see. We'll see if that sort of goes somewhere. And then I'm always just kind of like auditioning and I do lots of voiceover stuff kind of on an ongoing basis from here. And, you know, you just never know. It's the life of the um, actor performer is you're kind of always in a state of like many irons and many fires and you never know what the next thing might be but it's to this point i've been sort of fortunate that somehow always i've been able to be involved in this business and and just kind of keep doing things that i love which is um you know i'm really grateful for it to be able to pursue and do what i love and it's always a bit of a surprise you sort of go i don't know like this year in the fall i was in a uh a show called um, American Crime Story, which was about the uh, Bill Clinton impeachment. And I got to play Clinton's lawyer. And that was Clinton was Clive Owen and uh, Edie Falco was Mrs. Clinton. And, uh, and, uh, you know, you just, you just never know. It's just all of a sudden you're, I'm standing opposite Clive Owen and going like, oh my God, you're, you're such an amazing dude. And here we are, you know, play acting this, uh, period in history and uh, I'm pretending to be a serious lawyer and, (laughs) you know, it's, it's kind of, it's crazy. You, you never really know what's going to be next. You, you just, you never know. You, you kind of, 
what you know is that it, no matter what, it will be a surprise that the next day is like, I don't really know what's going to happen next. <laughs> yeah. I think if I'm more quickly, didn't you have like a podcast called named Dexter or Dexter? Oh yeah. Dexter Guff. Yeah. Yeah. Dexter Guff mm-hmm. is smarter than you. Yes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's a, another podcast that we did, which was kind of like, mm, there's another sub genre of podcasts mm-hmm. that are about, um, and self-empowerment, business gurus, um, mm-hmm. sort of in the world of self-help, but more of like the, the idea of Dexter Guff is he's telling everybody else how to lead their life, but his life is meanwhile just falling apart. <laughs> so it's kind of like, you know, he's a self-proclaimed uh, expert on all things. And, but of course, in reality, his life is a nightmare. So, it, you know, it again was like a satirical comedy approach to like i think there's a lot of people out there who are kind of like that who are like running off at the mouth about how to live your life but maybe maybe they're not the best examples of the yeah. person that should be doing that so <laughs> yeah. so for me it was like a kind of a fun a fun world to play in and that's you know that's another one that's out there that's like I, we're not doing the podcast really anymore but um but I feel like there's, I think there's, an, there's another life for good old Dexter Guff. So I haven't said goodbye to him completely because mm-hmm. I really love that character. And I also think like, eh, there's, there's, that's a, that's a, a world ripe for satire and there's, there's more to be done, more to be done with Dexter Guff. So yeah. stay, stay tuned, stay tuned. Nice. Okay. What is your acting advice and voice acting advice for people? Um, um <clears throat> you know, I think. I never had a plan of getting involved in entertainment. Like it wasn't like I sort of grew up saying like, I'm going to be in entertainment. Mm -hmm. I literally, I was pursuing something that I loved, which was with great teachers, like teachers in middle school, high school Mm -hmm. and onwards pursuing just something that I loved um, that, you know, teachers were encouraging me to pursue. And I never really, I never really knew what it would amount to. Like, I never really thought I'd ever leave Calgary. I always thought like, yeah, I, I improvise. I love doing this. I'm, I do comedy right here. I I will always live here. This is what I love to do. And then another door opens and it's like, okay, you're, you have an opportunity to go to school in Montreal. Okay. Well, I'm going to go to school out here. And I'm pursuing what I love. And when school finishes, I don't know. I, I don't really, it's not like I sort of said, like, I need to do this. Um, not saying that that's a bad thing. <laughs> Having a plan is never a bad thing. But I'm saying, like, as far as, like, my entry point to performing was always because it was something that I absolutely loved. Always. Mm-hmm. And it's the only thing that makes, that that probably makes you commit to, um to doing that as much as you need to. Like if it's what you want to do, it needs to be kind of like a 24 seven, you're passionately involved and you're always trying to like think about another way and an avenue and a creative voice to come out and, Mm -hmm. and like what, what, you know, what story you want to tell, what, you know, projects kind of live in you that you want to sort of Mm -hmm. put out there and share. And it's like, I think Mm -hmm. it really takes that kind of passion, which is basically, you're just saying like, If it's something that you absolutely love, if it's something that you absolutely love, you will find a way. If it's something that you absolutely love, and if it's not, if it's not something you love, it's going to be hard because you need to, you need to be passionately wanting to participate in whatever it is, uh, you know, every day to kind Mm of give yourself more opportunities. You need to show up in comedy rooms. You got to like take classes. You got to, you know, it's all these things that if you don't love it, probably feel like work. But if you love it, it's kind of like, no, this isn't work. I'm going to go watch another comedy show. Oh, my gosh, this person's teaching mm-hmm. classes. Oh, that's so cool. I can't wait to do that. I, that's so cool. It's like mm-hmm. if it's something you passionately love, you will find a way. You'll do it. There's no two ways. There's because you won't rest until you do. But yeah. if it's if it's not something that you absolutely love, it might mm-hmm. be hard. It might be hard. Yeah. There's no no guarantees. Right. So. I like to add, like, stay humble. Remember where you came from, you know? Absolutely. Well, and I think, I think quite honestly, that goes hand in hand with it being something that you love. I, I never, as I say, I never really, I always 
was like, I, I want to do this, but I never thought I'd leave Calgary. I never sort of thought like, I'm going to, I'm going to, that didn't really care. I didn't really, it didn't really, didn't really, well, it just wasn't a thing. It's like, I, I just love doing this. I, I'll do this in Calgary. This is what I'll always do. Oh, I'm moving here now. Okay. Well, there's an opportunity here. Oh, this is, oh, wow. Okay. Something's happening here. I just, they've yeah. invited me to, you know, perform over here. Okay. That's, oh, wow. Okay. It's yeah. like, if you don't sort of, if that's your entry point, you're simply humble by the fact that like, no matter what, you're grateful to be working and you get to do something that you absolutely love. And it's like, by those two measures, you will be, you can only be grateful. You can only be humble, really, you know, because yeah. you're like, oh, this is, wow, I'm doing what I love. I, they've invited me to come play. Cool. That's the best. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, before I ask you my last question, do you okay. have any questions, Peter? um what's your what is what do you what's your thing because here you are you're a great interviewer you've Thank you. you've got podcast you got it on youtube like what do you think what's your what's your thing is this is this what you would love to would you love to continue as an interviewer uh would you love to be doing voice acting would you love to be doing on-camera acting like what's where's your passion like, what do I want to do as a career? Like, a yeah, career? sure. Like, I, cause I, you're just such a wonderful interviewer. And it's like, you've already accomplished so much in, in doing this on your own and in your own avenue. I'm just curious, is it's kind of like, yeah, I'd like to keep on doing this. I like meeting and talking to people and, and hearing about, you know, different, uh, different lives, different ways people live and experience, you know, performing and doing their art, you know, like what's, what's your yeah. thing? I want to become like a director or like screenwriter because I love to write scripts. Um, believe it or not. Amazing. That's fantastic, man. Good for you. And that's, and that's like, um, it, it, I think to be a script writer, mm -hmm. you have to exactly as you've just said that you love writing. And, mm -hmm. and I think otherwise it will just seem like doing a bunch of homework because you got to write a lot. <laughs> yeah. So when it's like something that you love to do, you will, you will. You will write something that will be probably many things that will be produced, that'll be a movie or that'll be an animated show, that'll be like, uh, you know, on a streaming thing, that'll be a YouTube show, that'll be like, thank you. You will do it. There's no two ways. It's just a matter of like, which will be first and then what one you really like to do. But yeah. without question, if it's what you love doing, you'll do it. And maybe I could get Peter Olding to start it, right? <laughs> hey, listen, I, I'll, I would be more than happy to. Be more than happy to, I'll, you know, I'll send in a couple of auditions. I might not be right for the part. You're the, you'll be the director writer. You'll tell me, eh, you know, it was okay. I thought, I thought you'd do better. <laughs> Sorry. I, I tried my best. Maybe, huh. you know, maybe this is a, it's, it's a role better suited for Christian Potenza. I don't know. Well, Peter, is there anything you would like to promote and shout out? Like I'll link down below. Hmm. No, you know what? Just go uh, do check out do check out this sounds serious and check uh, because I I I think if you're into podcasts, I'm really I feel really proud of like that show. I think it's kind of a cool, interesting, different uh, comedic uh, show mm -hmm. to listen to. And you can go to peteroldring.com, and I keep you know updates as projects are happening, and it okay. feels like it's a great place that I'd love to be able to share with a couple of these projects that are in development, like as they kind of get solidified and are moving forward, I would love to be able to share them there so that you can kind of find other stuff that I'm up to. Um, so that's a, a good place to go and, and check it out for sure. I like the, I'll link the, I'll link those two down below. I love it. Beautiful. I got you. Well, thank you again, Peter, for being an awesome, amazing guest. Thank you. Joe, my friend, thank you so much for asking. And it is absolutely my pleasure without question. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just really uh, glad and touched that some of the stuff that I've been up to that I've sort of gotten to perform in that you've really enjoyed and, and um, you know, it was a really awesome conversation. So thank you. Yeah. I had a great time. Like we talked about total drama, your career. You know? Yeah. yeah. I, even, I, I even had to do some like voice matches. I even had to like call up Tyler from the past. <laughs> okay. okay well thank you all so much for watching have a great day everybody and stay awesome and you stay awesome peter sweet you too hey guys what is going on what's up hi how are you uh peter oldring here checking in with a quick video for you uh to let you know that if you have any questions for me about any of the characters 
that I did on Total Drama Island. So that is Cody. That's a Tyler. It's Ezekiel. Ezekiel was on it. Not for long. Really not for long, but he was on it. You know that. Uh, if you have any questions for me about them or about my experience on Total Drama, then let my good pal Joe know, and we are going to do a part two interview. An interview, part two, uh, based on your questions. So you can send those questions to at Jay-Z Productions 26 uh, so that Joe can ask me the next time that we do this interview and you can hear my answers. Also, please, for my good pal Joe, make sure that you like this video. Make sure that you like this podcast. However you're watching this, listening to it, uh, subscribe, share. Uh, and as Joe always likes to say, stay safe and stay awesome. Now I like to say that. So stay safe, stay awesome.